for our scripture reasoning today. If any of you would like to follow along, open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. And if not, you can follow it on the overhead screens. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. May the Holy Spirit enlighten our hearts and mind and give a special meaning to the reading of these words. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we seek God's presence. Lord, I can't speak, but your word is powerful and quicker, sharper than a two-edged sword. Please let your word minister to our hearts today through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been somewhat of a mild winter. We've had some cold days, <laughs> but we haven't had the snow laying on the ground like we did last winter. Remember last winter? A year ago, Snowstorm Jonas hit our area all the way up the eastern coast, dumping lots of snow. In fact, some of the major airports across the east had record snowfall at LaGuardia, JFK, Baltimore, Washington International there in D.C. They had 30 inches of snow and they had to cancel 13,500 flights during that period. I remember we had about 10 to 12 inches down in Portland, Tennessee, where Highland Academy is. I literally could not get out of my driveway for about uh, five days. We tried several attempts, and my tires just spun in place. And finally got the car back in the driveway. Do you ever feel like those jets on the frozen tarmac or the car on the icy road? Your tires just spinning in one place. You try to get traction in your Christian walk, you really want to surge ahead in Jesus Christ, but you're going nowhere. I want to look this morning at a passage of Scripture that will give us a recipe for revival and renewal in our Christian walk. If you would turn to Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel chapter 37, for several years I did biblical journaling through the book of Ezekiel, and this passage just arrested my heart. I want to share some thoughts with you this morning. Here we find a two-part recipe for renewal. We're going to look at this story this morning. First of all, Ezekiel 37, starting with verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the what? midst of the valley. I've been to a number of beautiful valleys in my lifetime, Yosemite Valley in California and Shenandoah Valley up in Virginia, that's the home state where I was born, and then Cades Cove is a beautiful valley as well over in the beautiful Smoky Mountain National Park. But this valley that God brought Ezekiel to in vision and set him down in the midst of was anything but beautiful. Continue reading, the end of verse 1. He set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Full of bones. Heaped high. Hundreds of thousands of bones. The text continues. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, gave him a guided tour, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. 
And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. It's impossible for man, but all things are possible for God. What on earth did these bones represent? Let's let the scripture interpret itself. Drop down to verse 11. And God tells Ezekiel what these bones symbolize. Verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of what? The whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. A unique setting that Israel found itself in at this very time. Because they apostatized and played the part of a spiritual harlot, God had to allow extenuating circumstances for Nebuchadnezzar and his mighty Babylonian war machine to come in and besiege Babylon three times Jerusalem, excuse me, three times Jerusalem was, was besieged in 605 B.C., in 597 B.C., and again in 586 B.C. July 18, 586 B.C., the city was decimated. The temple was raised to the ground, and all the people were taken captive. Imagine you being ripped away from your home, your temple, your city, and carted 1,200 miles up over the Fertile Crescent to this strange, foreign, idolatrous land by the name of Babylon. You're ushered in through the great Ishtar Gate, 45 feet tall, and the Babylonians are jeering at you. Our gods are stronger than your gods. Where was your god when you needed him? And you hang your heads in abject shame. You ever feel like that in your life, like God has abandoned you? Like you have come to the end of your rope and there is no hope. Maybe things are going rough in your education process and the academics. Uh, you're not scoring the grades like you would like. Maybe a girlfriend or boyfriend has just broken up with you or you're in a marriage relationship that is coming unraveled. Maybe you've just gotten word from the doctors that you have cancer and you only have a short time to live. Maybe your finances are shambles. Maybe you are struggling in your own spiritual walk and maybe you just figure you are meant to be fuel for the fires of hell. I can't get through this. Do you know what's amazing to me? At this precise time when Israel was at its lowest, God sent this vision in Ezekiel 37. In fact, it took about five months for them to travel to Babylon, and probably within several weeks, on January 8 of 585 B.C., this vision came to the Israelites, that I have hope for you. I can restore you. Although you feel like a valley of dry bones now, I can bring you to life again and resurrect you again. This message is for all of us today to give us hope and courage. There is a two-part recipe, two ingredients on how to be revived and renewed. The first part is God's Word. God's Word. Look at verse 4. Verse 4. Let's let the text speak to our hearts this morning. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones, say to them, Dry bones, hear the what? Not hear the 6 o'clock evening news. Not hear pop culture psychology, but hear the word of the Lord. What did God's word say for, Israel, for, for Ezekiel to do? Notice verse 5, thus says the Lord God, to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I want you to understand this must have been a very difficult message for Ezekiel to preach to a heap of dry bones. All right? 
What good is that going to do, Lord? These bones can't wake up and live again. I have conducted a number of funerals in my 34 years of ministry, and never once have I been tempted as I stand at the head of the casket to look down at the corpse and say, all right, get up, Marie, get up right now. (laughs) Now, I can say on the resurrection morning, Jesus will bring forth those who've fallen asleep in him. God was asking Ezekiel to preach to a heap of bones and say, you are going to live. Amazing. So Ezekiel took God at his word. And in verse 7 it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Bones you are going to live, because God's word said it, and he cannot lie. And as he was preaching, these bones start swirling around, and there's a clicking and a clattering, and they come together end to end. And there's muscle and sinew and organs and tissue and finally skin. And where there once was a heap of dry bones, there was now these perfect bodies, albeit still dead bodies. Notice the end of verse 8. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. What was it that brought these bones together into perfectly restored bodies? According to the text, the Word of God. God's Word has life-giving, vivifying power. When we get into this Word, it causes the deadness within us to come to life. Praise God. I've had the privilege of preaching many evangelistic series One of the most recent, I just finished up about a year ago in Hendersonville, Tennessee. There were some exciting things that happened. Sixteen people became Seventh-day Adventist Christians as a result of that evangelistic series. Several high points I want to share. How God's Word brought them to life. First of all, Candace, a 23-year-old pre-law student, she came night after night and said, Pastor David, God's Word is bringing me to life again. You see, when I was 11 years old, my mom and dad split, and I developed a deep-seated distrust and hatred towards my dad. He was no longer a part of my life. He abandoned me, and I displaced those feelings on my heavenly father. But as a result of getting into the Word nightly in this prophecy series, I've come to know my heavenly father as someone who loves me and has a plan for my life. And Candace was baptized at the end of that series. Fred. Fred grew up in Guyana in South America. He was in elementary school in Trinidad and Tobago. And one year he had an aunt who was a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and sponsored him to a year at the local church school. And Fred said that was like an oasis of peace in the midst of a turbulent childhood. Life went on, he graduated from high school, came to the States, became a successful car salesman, first in New England, then out in California. For 25 years, he practiced his trade. He was one of the best car salesmen in the country. In fact, his GM dealership in California was number one GM dealership in the entire nation. He was good at it. He transferred to Hendersonville three months before the meetings. He got a brochure in the mail, came out night by night, and God's word began to change his life. He said, Pastor Dave, I can no longer sell cars on Saturday. Went to his boss and said, Boss, I can no longer sell cars on Saturday. Guy, are you kidding? That's the big day for sales. But if you're foolish enough to want off, I'll let you off. Fred became baptized at the end of that series. Another guy by the name of Anthony, one more. He grew up in an Adventist home, went to Madison Academy, fell out of the church, away from God for a number of years, and at the age of 37, as the manager of a Cracker Barrel, 
the stress of life bearing upon him, had a major heart attack. That got his attention. And his partner, Danya, said, Anthony, maybe we ought to try God again and get back to church. And so three months before the meetings, they found, well, they started looking. And then right before the meetings, they got the handbill in the mail, came out. God's word began to change their life. They poured the alcoholic beverages down the drain. They cleaned out the refrigerator because they wanted a healthy lifestyle, especially in light of his heart attack. And the final week, they approached Pastor Reimer and myself and said, we'd like to get baptized, but something's got to happen first. We've been living together for the last several years. Can we have a wedding Sabbath afternoon before the baptism that Saturday night? Absolutely! So the Hendersonville Church was transformed into a beautiful wedding hall on the spot, and they said their I do to each other that afternoon, and that night they said their I do to Jesus and were baptized. Friends, God's Word has power to renew and transform our life. Let me ask you, are you spending time in this book? How is your personal devotional life right now? All of us have gone through the hit and miss, <laughs> the up and down. There was something that happened a few years back that uh, helped get me into a daily pattern of reading from God's Word. I do something called biblical journaling. And uh, what launched that is reading the book Desire of Ages, page 390. Look this up. It's in the chapter on the feeding of the 5,000. And to paraphrase, Ellen White says that just as we need food to grow physically, we need the spiritual manna to grow spiritually. And she says we need to take the Bible and read just one verse and ascertain the thought which God has placed in that verse for us until we know, thus saith the Lord. Now, I have customarily s tried to see how far I can read every morning in my morning devotion time. Read three chapters or five chapters or whatever. But this was telling me it's not so important how much you read, but how deep you read. Meditate, even if it's on a verse, and ask, God, what are you trying to say to me? So I apply three parts of my body when I read. Are you ready for this? I apply my head. First, apply my head in discovery. There are so many insights and gems and ahas in God's Word. Apply your head and discover those insights, those principles. But then we Adventists tend to be cerebral. We need to drop it 18 inches to the south as well. Not only apply our head, but apply our heart in application. God, what are you trying to say to me through that verse? Little case in point, I've been reading through Ephesians, and in chapter 1 it talks about how we're rich in Christ, and how he has an amazing uh, inheritance for us where he is just going to pour his eternal riches upon us. You know, I was smarting a little bit, and I'm being, my goodness, if mom and dad ever hears this, uh, I'll be in trouble. But they're 87 and 89. They just made up their will, and guess what? All the money's going to the church, folks. Now, I'm glad. I work for the church. But on the other hand, I'm smarting. I've been faithful all my life. I'm taking care of you guys, and you left us out of the will. So I'm reading through Ephesians 1. You are rich in Jesus Christ. You have an inheritance beyond which anybody can ever imagine. And God's saying, all right, Hartman, apply that to your life. 
You don't need to worry about the inheritance from your mom and dad earthly. Because I got an inheritance that's out of this world. Help me feel better. So you apply your head. Look for insights, principles. You apply your heart. God, what are you trying to say to me through this principle? And then you apply your hand. You go out and do, put into practice that which he's revealed to you. Praise God. It'll change your life. It'll change your life. So back to the story, Ezekiel 37, the first ingredient in this two-part recipe for renewal is the Word of God. Ezekiel preached the Word of God, and those bones became perfect bodies, but still no breath. The second ingredient to this two-part recipe is the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 9. Verse 9, and he said to me, prophesy to the what? The breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So Ezekiel did that. Here, these heap of bones are now perfect bodies. And he walks up and down through the length and breadth of that valley. And he says, breath from the four winds, breath of God, please breathe on these corpses that they may live. Do you know what that word breath is in the original? In the Hebrew is ruach. Ruach. It's used ten times here in chapter 37. More times than any other chapter in the entire Bible, ruach. And so what God really said to me last week is this chapter 37 is not so much about a valley of dry bones. This chapter 37 is about God's ruach, his breath that can bring us to life again. What happened? What happened when the heavenly breath came upon those bodies? Look at verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet a wimpy little army. What does it say? An exceedingly great army. What is the breath of God, the vitalizing influence of God that he longs to breathe into us? What is it, folks? The third member of the Godhead. Look at verse 14. It tells us that, verse 14. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. God's Holy Spirit is the hope of the church. It's the hope of the world. It's his Holy Spirit that can bring our deadness back to life. You know, really quick, uh, about eight, ten years ago, the church I was pastoring went through a very hurtful time, went through a church split. Literally, a church split. And throughout that course, I became very wounded. As the church split, my heart split, and I was resentful, and I was bitter, and it turned into deep-seated angry, anger. And on New Year's Eve, after about three years of this, struggling, trying to get rid of this hurt, I was on my knees and said, God, I don't want to go into a new year with a resentful heart. Would you please take care of this? And I found a mug uh, at Marshall's, and um, I bought it, brought it home. God impressed me to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit every day. Lord, flush me of my resentment, my bitter spirit, and fill me with your sweet spirit. And so I began to pray that prayer every morning, and that was about seven, eight years ago, and I have done that every morning. I get up, and I see that mug on my office desk at home, and it reminds me, I clutch it, flush me of self, fill me with you. And we need that daily exchange 
because we are corrupt to the core. <laughs> there is not one thing good within me. And God wants to flush out that which is hurtful, harmful, and hateful and fill us with his sweet spirit. There are two ingredients to a revitalized life. The word of God. you willing to pray for that and to ask for that every day this year? Let me share one more story as we close that uh, helps, to, helps to show how dear this chapter is to my heart. What the Word, what the Spirit can do, is capable of doing. In uh, July 6 of 2013, my brother was in a head-on collision on Taswell Pike in Knoxville. His pickup truck crossed the double yellow line and plunged into another pickup. And when the first responders came, they had to cut him out of the pickup with the jaws of life. They rushed him to the UT Medical Center, and he was in a coma. His whole body had been crushed, and his organs were bruised, and his brain was bleeding, and I heard about this, and the next morning I drove the three hours over to Knoxville, and I sat by his bed, and I said, God, it's over. My brother that's been out of the church for 25, 30 years, it's over. My brother that I've been praying for, and now this. I sat there listening to him breathe through this, this breathing tube, gurgling through this breathing tube, and these wires coming out of him, and God impressed me. David, as long as there's a God in heaven, it's not over yet. And he brought my attention to this Ezekiel chapter 37 and said, if I was able to raise a whole valley of dry bones and to bring those bones together again, I can heal your brother's broken bones and heal him physically. And if I could breathe my spirit and bring new life into those corpses, I can breathe spiritual life into your brother. So I began to claim that. God, heal my brothers physically and heal my brother spiritually. And you know, two and a half weeks later, he came out of his coma. And seven weeks later, he was wheeled out of the hospital. Hallelujah! And he will probably never work another day in his life because of his disabilities. But I see God at work. He asked me the other day, David, what translation of the Bible would you recommend I read? Is that my brother? And uh, I had just finished up a series of meetings, and uh, he said, hey, I'd like a set of the DVDs of your evangelistic sermons. Are you feeling all right, man? <laughs> And today, John is back with his wife, and he's on the road to recovery because there is a God in heaven who can do the impossible. You may feel like that car on an icy road spinning in place. You may feel like you're just never going to get ahead in your Christian life, but God can do all things through his word. Through his life-giving Holy Spirit, he can bring renewal to your soul. Lord, we're thankful that you don't leave us in our discouragement, our hopelessness, our despair, our sins, our financial woes, our marital failings. You have these two ingredients to renew us to bring life. And Lord, as we come forward, we ask with all our hearts that you would give us strength to get into your word every day so that that word would transform us and renew us and revitalize us, change us, Lord, into your image. Please, Lord, as well, we pray for a baptism of your Holy Spirit, not just now, but we want to pray daily for that baptism. It says in Christ Object Lessons that Jesus prayed daily for a fresh filling of that Holy Spirit. And if he needed that, how much more we need it. Please, Lord, use us as a church 
a collective body of believers to rise up as an exceedingly great army. We want this community of ours to know that there is a God in heaven who loves and cares and has a special plan, that has special revitalizing truths for the end of time. Please bless these meetings that are coming up in May. Anoint us, fill us, use us, so that there's many souls in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.